Good morning, Johannesburg Christian Family Church. Give yourselves a great big praise God hand clap for being in church today. And all of you in the overflow room, we're so glad you're there. Also, we are looking forward to being with you in person at celebration. Actually, before celebration, we'll be there. God bless you all. We are going to have a great service this morning. The message is titled, when are we going to start believing that God is on our side? After the children of Israel conquered the land of Canaan, years later, they backslid, and their enemies took them prisoner and destroyed their cities, pulled down the walls around Jerusalem. Nehemiah is determined to reconquer Canaan to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, and to claim back their inheritance. So let's read from Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 11, from the New Living Translation, and see what happened. If you want to follow with me in your Bible, that would be good, and I encourage you to bring Bibles to church. If you do, I promise you now, you will grow much faster spiritually, and you remember what you learn. All right, Nehemiah 4.11. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. All right, verse 12. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and the officials and all the people, the work is very spread out. We are widely separate from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding. Then our God will fight for us. Now notice what Nehemiah says. He says, our God will fight for us. Now, all the people are going to rush to that part of the wall with their swords, their spears, their arrows, bows and arrows. And they're going to use those weapons. But Nehemiah says, God will fight I thought the people were going to fight. Yes, they are going to fight. But because he said God will fight for us, then God will fight through them and they will be victorious. We've got to learn to confess that God is fighting our battles for us. Even though we are attending physically to the problem, we must confess God is taking care of it because then he can work through us and take care of it. Amen. All right. Verse 23, please. Verse 23. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the gods who were with me, even took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. So they carried their weapons no matter what they did, wherever they at all times, when they slept, they didn't get unchanged, they didn't get dressed, they stayed with their clothes on. This is telling us that we, this is a description of what we are dealing with today. We are in a warfare. The weapons of our warfare are found in Ephesians chapter 6. And among those weapons is the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith. 
we are in a warfare. All around us are demonic spirits in the atmosphere working through their unsaved agents to try and destroy the church, to try and take over the planet, bring all sorts of confusion and problems. That's what Satan's doing right now. He's trying to cause total chaos in the world. And he seems to be succeeding in some places, in most places actually, because Christians don't understand their authority. They don't understand what the Bible says. They don't understand their rights. They don't understand how to allow God to fight their battles for them. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to hear God's voice. And they're not serving God. They're cold and lukewarm. We're going to address that today. We're going to deal with that today. We've got to get on top of this. We cannot let the devil have everything while we are still here. While, when we go and the rapture happens and we go, the devil can have it. But he's not going to have it while we are here. We're going to stop him and we can. We are in charge. We should never put these weapons down at any time. They didn't put their weapons down and we mustn't put ours down. Never ever put down your shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. Never put it down. Or any of your weapons. What I mean by that? I'm, I'll explain as we go. The children of Israel were given the promised land of Canaan. But they had to fight to take possession of it. And they also had to fight to maintain possession of it. We must do the same. We've got to fight to take possession of what is ours, and we've got to fight to keep what is ours. I'm talking about what God has promised us in the new covenant. Now listen to the words of Jesus here in Mark chapter 4 and verse 14 from the New King James translation. The sower sows the word. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm sowing the word. And when you preach to somebody, you're sowing the word. And when you confess the word to yourself, you're sowing the word, even if it is to your own heart. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now Jesus gives us different categories of soil here, different kinds of soil in this chapter 4 of Mark. And he says, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in the heart. So the word of God is going into the hearts of those who listen to me here this morning. That's what Jesus said. That's where it goes. Into the heart. And Satan comes to take the word where? Out of the heart. Where, how long does he wait? Until you get out of the church service? Until you get home? No. While you're in church. Immediately. Now. He doesn't waste time. He comes right now to steal the word of God. Let's say this together. Satan will not steal the word from me today or any time. All right, verse 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word of God, immediately receive it with gladness. So there again, the word is sown. They receive with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. After, when tribulation or persecution rises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So we see here that Satan comes to the word, and then he attacks us to stop the word from working. That's what's happening here in verse 17. Satan comes with tribulation and persecution in our lives for the word's sake. Jesus is telling us that problems come our way, because Satan brings him to distract us and keep us from spending time in God's Word, from spending time in church. I can't go to church because all hell is broken loose today. Or I can't read my Bible because all hell is broken loose. Everything's going wrong. I don't have time to pray or read my Bible. Satan's come to steal the Word. These things that go wrong in our life have come from the devil Jesus said right here, right here in verse 17. To steal the word. Now these Christians are stony ground Christians. They stumble immediately and give up. So when problems come, 
they throw in the towel and they give up. They give up. They become passive. They don't rise up and use their faith and boldly declare what God's going to do for them. They submit to the devil's attack. They let him walk all over them. 18. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So this category are those people who are running around trying to earn a living, trying to make things happen to succeed in life in their own strength. They deceive by riches, the desire for other things, and the cares of life. They're taking care of their family, which is good. They're working, which is good. But they, their whole attention is on everyday life, trying to make it happen. They're caught up in the rat race, and they don't have time for God and His Word. They don't have time to go to church. They'd rather watch the service on TV at home, even though they could get to church. Now, it's fine to watch the service on, on TV at home. If you can't get to church, something happens. But for goodness sake, don't make that a choice when you can come to church because you're probably in this category here of this uh, verse 19. So, let's carry on reading then, verse 20. These are the ones sown on good ground. Let's go back to verse 19 here for a moment. So we see that all these problems of life come and distractions of life come sent by Satan, family. Why? For one reason only, to stop you spending time in the Word of God. Okay, now let's go to verse 20. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the Word, hear the Word, listen to it, accept it, and it bears fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. In other words, they act on what they hear. They believe it, and they act on it. They do it. They are doers of the Word, and they don't let the devil steal from them the Word of God. And what fruit is this that they produce? What fruit? The fruit Jesus is talking about here is to be productive in the kingdom of God, to be productive in the kingdom of God, working with the kingdom of God and for the kingdom of God to move God's kingdom forward. Just like Nehemiah, who built the wall and finished it, stayed with it. 24. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed what you hear. Folks are giving their ears to everything else that's unimportant instead of giving their ears to the Word of God. Spending time in the Word, reading the Word, meditating in the Word, coming to church to hear the Word, taking notes, bringing their Bible, writing in the Bible. Take heed what you hear, Jesus said. This is our Creator talking, family. He said, be careful what you listen to. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you, you hear more will be given. So Jesus said, if we'll listen to the word of God, we will succeed. We'll succeed. Satan comes to steal God's word out of our lives because he knows it's the source of our faith. And without faith, we are hopeless and helpless. The devil knows if we don't have faith, we are defeated. He can run all over us. And God can't help us. God can do nothing for us without faith. James chapter 1 and verse 7. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord without faith. Nothing. God can't help us. And Satan knows. So he comes to steal the word, which is the source of our faith. Faith comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10, 17. So, just because God gives you a purpose in life, a vision, doesn't mean it's going to happen without a fight. Just because, because God gives you a desire to accomplish something in life for Him or for your life, for your family, it doesn't 
mean that it's going to happen. No, the devil is going to try and stop you. You can count on that. And the battle zone, the battle zone is going to be in your mind. You might be desperately looking for answers and direction, even now, today. And your shield of faith might be in your right hand or your left hand, and your word, and the word of God, the sword of the word of God might be in your other hand. Your only option, child of God, is to move forward with courage. There's no other option. You don't have an option. You've got to move forward. You can't retreat. You can't lay down your sword and your shield. Do you understand that? We've got to fight this good fight of faith. Don't give up. We have got to start believing that God is on our side. Say that. I must start believing that God is on my side. Again, I must start believing that God is on my side. Even though you don't deserve it, not one of us deserve it. Not one of us can ever earn it, but God is on our side. We've got to believe that. It's called grace, family, and that's extended to every one of us. Not one person alive or ever born deserves God's help. Do you understand that? So don't the level lie to you and say you don't deserve it. You tell me, for once you've told the truth, but that doesn't matter, Mr. Devil, because by the grace of God, he is on my side. Stay strong in the Word of God. Stay strong in praying in the Holy Ghost. And listen to His guidance. Listen. He wants to talk to you. He's knocking all the time on our hearts to speak to us. Just say, I oh, listen, I'm hearing. Thank you. Talk to Him. Stay strong in worshiping God. In other words, make sure you do. Worship God in your heart. Sing to Him. Tell Him you love Him. Even with your mouth closed. Lie in bed and talk to Him. Tell Him you love Him and you worship Him. Worship Him at home and especially in church. Come to church early and worship God throughout the service. I guarantee you'll see a noticeable improvement in every area of your life. Hold fast the confession of your faith without wavering. Hold fast your confession of your faith without wavering. And you know, if I have to ask people, what are you confessing for? What confession do you have right now? 99% of people won't even know what I'm talking about. They'll look at me like a cow at a new gate. If you don't have a confession, find one, get one, and start confessing it. Hold fast to it is the instruction of God. Make sure you have a confession about your situation, your challenges, and your future. If you don't do this, child of God, Satan will find ways of weakening you. And he'll wear you out and wear you down until you give up. He'll separate you from the things that can put you over. Satan hates people who have a God-given purpose in life. He will send problems to you for sure. So that you stop praying. So that you stop reading your Bible. So that you stop going to church. He'll try and, wait, he'll try and tell you, watch TV, at church on TV at home. Or tell you, go to a movie so you can relax and rest. <laughs> the way to rest is sleep, pray, read your Bible, worship God, and then you'll find rest in your heart. There's no other way to get rest in your heart. God put a vision in the heart of Joseph. And when he shared that vision with his family, they tried to kill him. That's how they said, well done, I love your vision. Satan is afraid of those who have a vision or a purpose. He will cause people to lie about them and to criticize them like they did to Joseph. And some people are dumb, some people are sly, some are mean, and some are nice. But some are real and some are nice. 
And you'll have all kinds of people around you at all times. The nice ones, the ugly ones. You can't allow these things to stop you. You can't allow compliments to stop you, and you can't allow criticism to stop you. You can't allow these things to change your outlook on life. We must still walk in love. We must still show the nature and character of Christ. We must understand that Satan is behind all of the problems that come our way. The Bible tells us during the millennium reign of Christ, for the thousand years that he rules and Satan is locked up, that to be nothing that hurts or harms or destroys during that thousand year period. That a child can put their hand into a nest of snakes and they won't get bitten. That a child will be able to play with a lion and it won't hurt them. A lamb, can, a lamb will lay down the lion, it won't be eaten. That's the kind of thing that's going to happen in the millennium when the devil's locked up. So we understand that he's causing the havoc around us. We are fighting a war. We are wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. But God is for us, and therefore the question is, who can stand against us? It is essential for us to stay full of faith, full of joy, full of boldness, and rest in our God. The only way to do that is to spend time with God. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And many people find the broad way, and few find the narrow way. But our purpose is on the narrow way. We cannot deviate from living out our instructions that are given to us in the Word of God. We've got to live out the instructions given to us in the Word of God. We can't deviate from them. It's on the narrow way that we find our purpose. Remember, the battle zone is in the mind. Satan is fighting for the control of your thoughts. Understand our enemy is not people. It's not flesh and blood. Our enemy is Satan himself. We are to win our war against the kingdom of darkness. We are to war, win our war against fear, against doubt, and against unbelief. We are to win our war against confusion. And we'll do it the same way that Old Testament saints did it. People like King Jehoshaphat, King David, Gideon, Nehemiah, Joshua, Caleb, and many others all conquered their enemies, overcame huge obstacles, and moved forward to accomplish what God set before them. Even though it was God's will, they still had to fight. They had to go through the heat of the battle. They all used the same principles in every case. Principle number one, they boldly declared what God would do for them. Principle number two, they praised God for the promises in His Word before they saw the victory in the natural. Principle number three, they refused to entertain the thoughts of doubt, the thoughts of unbelief, the thoughts of fear, uncertainty, and confusion that Satan will bar their mind with. Hear me, child of God. All those thoughts of confusion, doubt, fear, uncertainty, every one of those thoughts are from Satan. And he tells you that you thought them. He tells you those are your thoughts, that you messed up. No, it's the devil putting all that in your mind. Don't bother with it. Get into the Word. Just ignore it. Go right to the Word. Go right to the Word. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Read your Bible. Meditate on the promises of God. And all that will quieten down because it's not from God and it's not you. It's the devil. Now, people who are of faith recognize that this has all come from Satan and not from God. Listen to the statements made by men of God in the heat of their battle. In 1 Samuel 17, 46, David called out to Goliath, and he said, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, for this battle is the Lord's. And that's what we, just, we should say that. 
to the problems that come our way. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. This battle is the Lord's. When King Jehoshaphat and Judah were facing certain defeat, they probably were outnumbered 100 to 1 with the army that came against them because Judah is a small tribe, one of the tribes of Israel. Second Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat instructed his army to shout out while marching to battle. They're marching to battle, actually in the natural to certain death, right? Outnumbered maybe 100 to 1, okay? And this is what the king says to the army. He says, I want you to shout, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. That is, sing that. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. With hands raised, singing as they marched to the battle. In the natural, to certain death. But they sang praises to God before they saw the victory and God delivered them totally. When the 12 spies came back from spying out the land of Canaan, 10 of the spies said, we cannot conquer the land because there are giants in the land. But Caleb stood up in the heat of the battle, in the heat of that moment, that moment of doubt, with 3,000 Israelites listening to these doubting Thomases. And this is what Caleb said in Numbers 13, verse 30. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome those giants. In Joshua 10, the children of Israel are marching from Egypt to Canaan. Five kings, the Amorites, attacked them. They were outnumbered greatly. In the heat of the battle, Joshua cries out because the sun was setting. He didn't want to regroup the next day and start all over. So he shouts, sun stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still in the midst of, of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And the Bible says there has never been a day like that where the Lord heeded the voice of a man. Where the Lord heeded the voice of a man. He just commanded the sun and moon to stop in the sky, and it did. In Judges chapter 7, the Midnights attacked Israel. In the heat of the moment, while adrenaline is rushing, Gideon shouts a command to his 300-man army. A 300-man army, that's all he had, and he was probably outnumbered 1,000 to 1. The Bible says you couldn't see the end of the, of the, of the enemy soldiers. You could not see it. That's how far it went. And he shouts this command to his 300 soldiers as they're going to charge, 300 are going to charge thousands upon thousands, okay? And they're all waiting <laughs> for Gideon to find out what he wants to do. And he shouts them, Judges 7, 14. He says, Arise, <laughs> for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. He says, God has delivered Thousands upon thousands into your hands. Not going to, he has. Notice that. He set the thermostat on has. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. You set the temperature in the room by setting it, the thermostat to the temperature you want. And the house temperature comes down to that number or up to that number. But you can set the circumstances of your life by your words. And when you say it, circumstances will line up with what you said about them. He says, Arise, the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand before they go into battle. We have the mighty Holy Ghost in us, child of God. He is our comforter. He is our guide. And He leads us through the battles of life from victory to victory, praise His holy name. I said everything up till now, so I could say this. When it seems like your giants are overpowering you and crushing you, and it seems like your giants are winning, when it seems like the thoughts in your mind have seized control of your emotions, and your thoughts have seized control, your doubts have seized control of your future, when it seems like all hope is gone, 
find a scripture in the Word of God that promises you victory in that situation. Find one scripture. Search the Bible till you find it. Until you see a spark of life coming from that scripture. And spend time with it. Meditate on it. Read it out loud. Pray over it. And start saying it to your friends and family and strangers. And stay with that scripture and confess it to your family and friends and say what God's doing for you. It doesn't matter if it takes a week, a month, a year. Confess it. I guarantee you one thing, you'll not sink. You will go over. God's word will put you over because God's word cannot fail. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And if you'll build your life on the rock, that's the word of God, hearing and doing the word, the storms of life will not defeat you, child of God. That's a promise from Jesus in Matthew 7. So that's the key, the answer, the solution to the challenges you are facing today. One verse of Scripture is enough to put you over. Remember, God's power is not distributed evenly among all of His Scriptures. No, God's power is, all of God's power is in every Scripture. All of God's power is in every scripture because God will not let one of his words fail. All of God and all of heaven is behind everything God ever said. So you can take it to the bank, child of God. If you can find a scripture, you've got the victory. Say that, if I can find a scripture, I've got the victory. And you sure have. All right, Satan is terrified of God's word and he will back down. He is terrified of God's word, and he will back down. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, please, and every eye closed. How many would say, Apostle Theo, today I want to be sure I'm going to heaven one day. I don't know where I'm going when I die, but I want to be sure that I will go to heaven. If you are here today, And you need that assurance. You don't know God. You don't know Jesus. You're not sure about heaven or hell. Please don't leave without making sure of that today. And God wants you to have that assurance. He wants to put that assurance in your heart right now. So I'm going to pray a little prayer and God will give you that assurance. But if you invite him to speak to you, he will. If you don't, he won't. He's a gentleman, if I could use that term. He will not invade your life without invitation so, when I count to three, if you'll slip that hand up so Jesus can see it and I can see it, people have their heads bowed, their eyes are closed. This is between you and God right now. Slip up your hand when I count to three. Are you ready? And God will give you that assurance. Here we go. One, two, three. Thank you. Slip those hands up right now. Jesus is waiting, anticipating that you'll respond to his love. So all over the auditorium, hands are raised. Keep them raised. Leaders are coming to put their hands on your shoulders right now to let you know that we love you and Jesus loves you while I say this little prayer. All right, go ahead, leaders. So I invite everybody to say this prayer with me. Everybody, especially those who raise their hands. Let's say this together. Dear God in heaven, all right, let's do that again. Now. We can do better than that. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to die on that cross in my place. He took my punishment for my sin. Thank you, Jesus. Come into my heart. Save my life. Be my Savior today. I believe in you. I declare you are Lord of my life. That means I'll live for you, Jesus, with all of my heart. You are first in my life. From today, because I said that, God is now my Father. I'm now God's child. I'm born into God's family. I'm now born again. 
Praise God, I'm saved and I'm bound for heaven. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.